Calimera, Calispera, Calinicta traders, wherever you are in the world, I hope you're doing well, I hope you're safe, I hope you're healthy, I hope you've got a big smile on your face, and I hope you're catching pips as usual. Apologies to my Greek followers if I absolutely butchered the first three words. But since I'm spending the next few weeks here in one of the Cycladus Islands in Greece, I thought it's a good idea for me to record myself. I don't show my face a lot on the channel at all and say a few words before we actually get into the video today, which is about the basics of direction analysis. I'm gonna be quick and brief, especially because I don't want people to unsubscribe now that they're seeing my ugly face. But I just very quickly wanted to speak about this idea of trade and travel or this marketing strategy of trade and travel where a lot of people, a lot of courses that are teaching finance or teaching trading tend to always want to tell people you can easily pick up your stuff and go wherever you are in the world as soon as you learn a strategy or as soon as you start trading. Cap. And yes, guaranteed once you learn a skill set, any skill set in fact that helps you make money online, you can do it from wherever you are in the world. But what they don't tell you is the pictures and the videos that you see of these people sitting on the beach with a margarita in their hand and their laptop in front of them and taking trades is oftentimes fake. It's not exactly real. They're not entirely real traders. Now, I made a promise to myself and to you guys to share the truth about the industry. Hashtag freedom of information, as you've seen already. That's why I'm elaborating a little bit more about this idea of trade and travel. What they don't tell you is that it takes time for you to get used to a new time zone. I've been trading from London for a good few years now. I'm four and a half years in my journey. Every single day of that has been in London. So for me to now completely go to a different country, spend a few months there, I have to first get used to their time zone, then allow my daily schedule to get in tune with that all of these factors can affect my trading especially in an industry where it's a game of probabilities where we are already at a disadvantage when you change the tiniest factors in your day-to-day -day routine and in your life it can have a major impact on your trading so can you pick up your stuff and go and trade and travel? Of course you can. But what they don't tell you is that it takes time for you to get used to the new time zone. It takes even longer than that for you to be comfortable with your strategy, with your trading style. And it's definitely not something that you can just pick up and do instantly where you are taking signals and you can go wherever you want in the world and take these signals or you learn a quick little strategy that can catch you 20 pips a day and you can now sit on the beach or wherever you want in the world and use that strategy to make money. It doesn't actually work like that. So you're seeing me trade from Greece right now but what you didn't see is that I didn't execute a single trade last week the first week that I was in Greece I didn't allow myself to execute trades I was on the charts I was analyzing but it would have been a bit naughty of me to want to instantly jump on the charts and start taking trades because there was a few different factors that changed from my day-to-day -day routine that could have had a major impact on my trading so I just allowed myself to get used to the time zone to get used to the daily schedule and all of these things and got back into trading intraday trades especially from this week and guaranteed I was lucky enough to take a monstrous trade on GBP USD about two three weeks before I came to Greece which I'm still in it's actually a, been extended into a swing position it has officially marked the best trade of my career the highest risk reward that I have ever executed I'm pretty sure I'm gonna record a detailed video about this later so that made it slightly easier for me to be able to take a step away from the charts and actually allow myself to enjoy the first week here and allow myself to get used to the different time zones but anyway I don't want to just keep repeating myself I just very quickly wanted to perhaps debunk this myth of trade and travel can you travel the world once you learn the skill set well once you start to make money once you especially know a currency pair well of course it's something that you can do but for people and courses to be using this trade and travel to lure people who are genuinely trying to change their lives who are genuinely trying to change their families' lives who are genuinely trying to make money from the industry into their courses and selling the courses to them and oftentimes strategies and information that doesn't even help them you know, that is disgusting. I don't know how you feel about that, but it's definitely disgusting in my mind to think that there's people who are portraying trade and travel in this sense just to lure people into selling courses and X, Y, and Z. And you know, it might be a bit ironic for me to record this while I'm on holiday here in Greece, but I just wanted to keep it real with you. I've spent about four and a half years trading and majority of that have been focused on pound dollar. It's a pair that I know extremely well. And as I said, I didn't trade last week. So I allowed myself a full week to get used to the time zone, to allow myself to get in a new routine of what time I'm going to be waking up, what am I going to do in the morning before London Open and also allowing myself to keep reminding myself that hey, London opens at 10 a.m., New York opens at 3 p.m. And it's definitely not something I plan to do to be in a different country every month. I hope to travel more by the end of the year, but it's still going to take me around a week or two to get used to the new time zones, to get used to my own daily schedule based on that time zone. And I have to allow myself that time to not allow it to affect my trading. And these are the factors that they don't tell you when they shove trade and travel in your face. So yeah, hashtag freedom of information, hashtag 
stop the cap in this industry. I just wanted to say a quick couple words about it. Of course, you can travel the world once you learn trading well. Of course, you can travel the world once you start to make money from the industry. But it's not as easy as they portray it to be for you to just learn a quick strategy or take signals from wherever you are in the world and start to make money from it. Anyway, I think I've spoken enough. Let's actually get into the video. We're going to go through some basics of direction analysis, some do's and don'ts, but emphasis being on the word basics of direction analysis because direction analysis is something that's different for person to person. And to be honest, it's not actually what a lot of people struggle with as far as I know. You know, a lot of people are good at analyzing the direction, but it's the entries that they get in trouble. But there's a few important key factors to mention for direction analysis, which you're going to see in a second. And at the end of the video, you're going to see a 1 to 10 GBP USD trade breakdown. So yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Let's jump straight into it. Okay, so let's speak about the basics of direction analysis. There are many different tools that can be used to define the direction of a market. And practically all of these will work if you use them correctly and and especially if you use them with correct take profits. There are a few items that I haven't even included on the screen right now, but let's briefly speak about the stuff that I have included and elaborate a little bit further as to how people use them. Market structure being one of the key tools that people use to define the direction of a market. Elliott waves or Elliott wave theory is a subsection of market structure in my opinion, where obviously once you learn market structure, you wouldn't even necessarily need to use Elliott waves. Now, I don't wanna make anyone emotional if you're using Elliott Waves and if you're an Elliott Wave trader, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I never say that, but I'm saying it's a subsection of market structure. So once you have a good understanding of market structure, then Elliott Waves naturally falls under that, which means you have already a good understanding of Elliott Waves as well. Some others like to use Wyckoff schematics to define the direction of a market. It's important for us to know that Wyckoff should not be used on its own. So you shouldn't just look at anything that looks like a distribution or looks like an accumulation and then think to yourself, okay, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and trade it that way because that kind of looks like the schematic. That's why a lot of the times we use Wyckoff schematics and supply and demand hand in hand together or Wyckoff schematics and market structure hand in hand together. And to be honest, supply and demand is more or less a subsection of Wyckoff schematics as well. Some of you may say it's the other way around. Wyckoff is a subsection of supply and demand. It doesn't really matter. I'm just saying that because the schematics are much older than the explanation of supply and demand that we are trading on a day to day basis right now. And when I say traders use them hand in hand with each each other obviously through other videos hopefully by now you know that when you have a schematic you have to wait for some type of an invalidation of a relevant supply or demand level before you take the trade so um, a lot of the times when you see the schematic and that invalidation that can give you the direction for your trade some other traders like to use fundamentals or the world news the economic news to define the direction of a given currency pair I'm not too knowledgeable and experienced in the world of fundamental analysis so I'm not going to comment on this too much especially because I don't do this I don't actually Actually use fundamentals to define a direction of a trade. We oftentimes use fundamentals to help us with managing a swing position. Unless there are some extremely obvious factors that point towards a currency losing strength over an extended period of time, then of course we can allow that to not completely decide our direction, but help us with finding a more logical direction to trade for that given period of time. For a lot of the intraday traders, people who want to be in and out of their trades in the space of 24 to 48 hours, obviously the session open moves is extremely important where you pay attention to what's taken place in the first hour or two of a session open and what have been the objectives. And by the word objectives over here, I'm referring to, okay, did the session move manipulate a certain level? Did it mitigate a certain level? Did it create liquidity? Did it create schematics? Did it accumulate or distribute? What has it actually done? And it's important to note that that should be used alongside other confirmations so it's not enough for you to just see London session open and sponsored the price up with what looks like an accumulation and then you go ahead and instantly buy it at that accumulation there has to be a couple other steps of your analysis a couple other confirmations depending on the strategies that you use but oftentimes the session open moves and what takes place in the first hour or two tends to give us a good idea of the direction that we can trade for that given day now before I even speak about these two items and I would imagine some of you are confused as to why I have written these on the screen right now I like to make this distinction between use of indicators or you know Fibonacci and market patterns and retail concepts for direction analysis 
versus for entries. I am heavily against using these things to find your entries. When it comes to indicators or when it comes to Fibonacci, market patterns, all of these things, I'm not saying they don't work. Of course they can with good risk management, etc., etc. But oftentimes they're not going to give you decent entries. And not only that, oftentimes the entries that they give are going to be manipulated before the market goes in that direction. But some of the indicators, some of the patterns or even Fibonacci levels can actually be used to find the direct direction of that market for the period of time that you're looking to trade. For example, when I was trading retail concepts, I was indeed using a lot of these to find the direction of the market. And a lot of the times it would work out. You would oftentimes be on the right side of the direction, but because you were using the same concepts for entries, every single time you were just being manipulated out before the market went in your favor. Do I use these right now to analyze direction or do I use them at all in my trading? The answer is no. I do not include them in my analysis. I do not include them in my trading at all but I just wanted to put them on the screen just in case some of you are used to using them some of you are comfortable with using them and through your own journey of back testing and trading you have found that it's actually useful for finding direction I just wanted to make that distinction between using them for direction analysis versus for entries they could be very useful for direction analysis but for entries probably not and to be honest, the end goal is to not have to use any indicators or anything like that and know the direction and the entries just based on price action alone. Now, before we go any further, remember that this is a game of probabilities. I'm sorry if you hate mathematics. I'm sorry if you hate statistics and probabilities, but it is what it is. That's just the truth of the market. I'm not saying you need to be a great mathematician for you to be a successful trader. Guaranteed that analytical mind will help you. But what I am trying to say is ignoring what a mathematical market this is, ignoring what a probability based market this is, will reduce your chances of success. So 50% accuracy is amazing. I'm going to repeat this in literally every single video until it's internalized. 50% accuracy is phenomenal, which means if you have 50% accuracy with good risk to rewards, be happy. Some weeks you'll close with less winning trades and some with more, but 50% accuracy, if you have reached that throughout the trading week or a month, be happy. You've done something right to reach that accuracy. Elaborating more on the investor's approach towards trading or towards any financial market, it's important for us to focus on small losses and big wins and not just less losses and more wins. A lot of the times the industry focuses on just cutting down on all of your losses and trying to win every single trade, whereas the focus should be cutting down on how big your losses are and trying to increase your wins. So small losses and big wins. Exactly as it was said in the movie, The Big Short. So when they were wrong, they were wrong small, but when they were right, they were right big. You can see even in that scene, they don't necessarily focus on less losses and more wins. It's about small losses and big wins. This is probably going to be the most important slide in this whole video. After this, we're going to move on to a quick one to 10 trade breakdown as well. But you've heard me say this multiple times before. Scenario to scenario is different. So you don't have to just decide the type of trader you are, whether you're a scalper, whether you're an intraday trader, whether you're a swing trader or a position trader. You also have to define from trade to trade from scenario to scenario how long you want to be staying in that specific trade think of it like this the term intraday intra intra means within within a day so within a day when you're intraday trading that means you're practically in and out of your trade within the same day but that's quite vague because that could be a matter of a couple hours to all the way up to 24 hours and a lot can happen in those extra few hours you can be in a trade that goes maybe 10 20 30 40 pips in a matter of a few hours but if you stay in the same trade for around 24 hours you know that trade can go 50 60 70 100 pips and it can literally be a whole different range you're trading you can break another structure you can go and mitigate somewhere else there's so much that can happen so it's not enough for us to just know what type of trader we are we also have to pay attention to that specific scenario that we are trading for that day and know how long we want to be in that specific trade. This is more so moving towards a take profit analysis, as I was talking earlier, where you can be correct about the direction of the market if you're correct about where you want to get out of the market. As an example, just looking at this thing that I have drawn here, you have technically three different ranges that you're trading. The blue trend, bigger time frame, orange, medium time frame, and green, the lower time frame trend. So if you're at this point in the market, 
technically speaking, if you're trading the orange trend, you're correct to say that we are bullish. The direction of the market will be bullish. But if you're on slightly higher time frames, then obviously it's slightly incorrect to say that you are bullish. More so you're on the bearish side of the trade. If you're intraday trading and you're looking at the short term trade from down here to, for example, these highs or even slightly above those highs, then you're correct. The direction of your trade, of your specific trade is bullish. And after that, you can reverse and go down, whatever. You're in and out of your trade and you've taken your profit. So that's why take profit is extremely important in direction analysis. That's why I'm going to be breaking down in the trade example in literally a couple minutes. But sometimes even looking at a trend like that will give you a lot of confusion because you wouldn't even know which trend you should be trading. I call this a time frame confusion or the time frame relevance, we can call it, because that is dependent on how long you want to be in that specific trade. So everything that we just spoke about will come in play with how many time frames you actually need to analyze. As an intraday trader, I would say you wouldn't necessarily need to even look at hourly or above. You know, hourly can be the highest time frame you look at and you can focus on the time frames below that. Sometimes I look at the hourly and 15 minutes to take some trade and then refine it more on the minute based time frames. But from time to time, I'm just analyzing the market on the five minute, three minute and one minute time frames or even just the three minute and the one minute time frame. I'm using the same set of rules that's still an intraday trade, but I'm focused on the much, much smaller range. But because I know where I need to be getting out, because I'm paying attention to the range that I'm trading, they end up being successful trades as well. I don't always need to be looking at higher time frames. And this industry is extremely obsessed with confusing you with a lot of different words, with a lot of different time frames, practically with anything that they can. You know, there's so many different time frames that you can focus on, and these are not even all of the time frames. You know that you can get one minute, two minute, three minute, four minute, five minute, six minute, seven minute, whatever. Like there's practically infinite number of time frames that you can actually use to analyze. And sometimes I can help you when you're doing top down analysis. When I'm doing swing trades, for example, of course, I have to pay attention to higher time frames, such as daily as well, such as four hour, even weekly time frames. But oftentimes it can do more bad than good when you're focused on so many different time frames. And when you're analyzing every single time frame, you get confused because you're seeing so many different trends happen. You're seeing so many different points of interest and you don't know what to do. You don't know how to connect the higher time frames to the lower time frames. So the best way to counter that would be limiting the number of timeframes that you focus on, but also paying extreme attention to the range that you're trading to know exactly where to get out of the market. Okay, so now for the trade breakdown, let's have a look at this GBP USD 1 to 10 scenario to the downside. I'm really, really happy that I screen recorded this last night as it came to entry and started to go in our direction. I actually screen recorded the entire analysis and I'm really happy I did because this candle did not exist yesterday. This behavior did not look like this yesterday. I'm gonna go on three minute time frame because the screenshot was taken on three minute time frame. This is what you see now. This is what we saw yesterday. This is the same picture, the same three minute time frame, same currency bet. Look at that. I have no idea what happened on forex.com data feed for this now to all of a sudden look like this. It's a little bit strange. Um, I screen recorded the analysis before, so at the very end of this breakdown, I'm going to put two little clips that you can kind of see my thought process as the trade was going in our direction and as the trade hit that 1 to 10 mark. But as of right now, just for me to be able to show this analysis slightly better, we're going to move to FXCM data feed so we don't end up seeing this random wick that just, or random candle that just doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, so yeah, this is this is false, basically. This shouldn't be here. And to be honest, I would imagine this to be corrected over the next few days. We'll see. I have no idea why Forex.com is, is being weird. Um, but let's quickly switch to the FXCM data feed just for this breakdown. You, you can see how different it looks, right? This was the level that we were trading based on. Look at that. I have no idea where this comes from on Forex.com. And then FXCM looks normal. <laughs> but anyway. Again, at the end of this video, you will be able to see a couple quick breakdowns as this trade was going in our direction and kind of what I was waiting for. Why did I expect this to go 1 to 10, so on and so forth. But just very quickly, um, currently, by the way, it's 13th of May, it's Friday. It's currently 11.37 a.m. UK time. This screenshot was taken yesterday at 2.44 p.m. UK time. This is all still UK time. Uh, I haven't changed my trading view time to Greek time yet. We were waiting for the market to come back up and in a way mitigate a one minute 
candle at the top there was some upside liquidity and downside liquidity as well so let's speak about this scenario a little bit more first things first pound dollar was on a bearish side for a very long time you know on the high time frames when you look at gbp usd it's just been dropping and dropping and dropping uh, it's been coming down so aggressively for quite some time to be honest so we wanted to just continue taking similar trades in the same direction with this gas deal between the us and europe we did expect more bearish pound and more bullish dollar and then that was accompanied by the local elections which um, added more uncertainty to the uk economy the rise of cost of living all of these things all of these factors were just pointing towards a bearish pound and even the technicals behind it was pretty easy to analyze and see kind of what was taking place and what we can trade based on first First things first, we were coming off the mitigation of an Asian supply. So there was an Asian supply. This was Asian open. First, it pushed the price down, came back up, gave a small distribution that started to sponsor the price below, mitigations of that that started to sponsor the price below. So there was a level of supply at the top of that range. So as this market came back up and mitigated that Asian supply again, I started to have a look at potential sell positions to see if it's um, you know likely for us to be able to get in some sell positions. Before I go into the breakdown properly, by the way, if you pay attention to this video right now, you don't even necessarily have to look at the next two clips that I'm gonna add at the very end of this, simply because I'm gonna just repeat myself in those, in those two clips. I just wanted to add those two clips at the end of this analysis. So you see me kind of analyze live, I suppose, and just my live thought process, and also for you to be able to see the forex.com data feed yesterday and how different it looked. But when we spoke about direction analysis, the technical aspects of it and all of these things, we were speaking about knowing the range that you trade and the technical side of things and the take profit aspect of things. So there was two possible entries to take when it comes to the mitigation of that one minute candle. You can consider this the first mitigation of that one minute candle and a small distribution looking behavior. The trade that I got in was over here, was the secondary mitigation of that candle. And there's a very good reason for that as well. When you look at this range coming up, you can obviously see some minor breaks of structure within this range to the upside. We're on the one minute time frame, right? So we're speaking about a very, very small range. And you can also see this bullish trend being created here, sponsoring the price higher and higher and higher. So technically speaking, the first mitigations or these mitigations of that candle were going to be slightly more risky because you still wouldn't have known whether or not this market is going to respect the range of that Asian supply if the market is going to just blow past it, you know, reaccumulate again and go, or if it's going to respect it. And at that time, we still hadn't seen an element of proof, a break of structure to the downside or invalidation of a level of demand. You might argue with me and say, oh, hang on, Pips, there is this rally base rally over here that the market invalidated, which means the mitigations of that candle after that would have been valid entries. I don't argue with you. Yes, there was a rally base rally there. Yes, that rally base rally was invalidated. And yes, you could have traded the first mitigations of that candle. But this is where having a take profits in mind is extremely important and knowing the range that you trade. You are now trading based on a very, very low time frame break of structure, which means you cannot extend your take profits from here all the way down to these lows. Because that BOS over there does not dictate the market coming all the way down there. What this BOS in itself dictates is that the market is just going to go to the next level of demand. And when you pay attention to this whole range, you can see that level of demand, that rally base rally that was created, it wasn't, you know, important at all. We started to see the sponsorship of the price above from these levels, from these levels up. So what was the significance of that rally base rally? What did it actually do? It didn't do anything specific for me to think to myself, oh yes, that demand has been invalidated and therefore the price can be extended all the way down. And guaranteed, if you took trades here with your stops above, you would have eventually successfully been able to get yourself out of the trade if you didn't break it even as it came down there. If you did break it even, then yeah, that would have been a broken even trade and then the market would have gone in your direction. So speaking of take profits and the range that you're trading, if you were trading based on this invalidation, your take profit should have been here. So you're not wrong in your direction, but you were wrong in the take profits. You should have gotten out of the trade at these levels because it's invalidated the first level of demand. You look lower. Where is the next valid level of demand? You can see a whole rally base rally over here. You can see this candle in the middle that actually manipulated up, manipulated down, sponsored the price above. So technically speaking, as it started to approach these candles, you should have been looking to get out of the trade and you were completely correct in the direction for it to be bearish 
for your specific trade. This is why I emphasized earlier saying for your specific trade. Whereas instead of all of this, what I just waited for is to see if we are going to invalidate some more relevant levels of demand, such as this one that we were talking about. So once it started to reach below it and invalidate these levels to the downside, then it was a bit clearer that we can potentially trade the next mitigation of that candle. And there was some upside liquidity. There was this trend line liquidity being created. So, you know, it gave me confidence to know the institutions are creating liquidity. And in the process of mitigation of that candle, they will be manipulating that liquidity. This trade ended up being a successful trade all the way to the downside for a 1 to 10 scenario. Once it hit 1 to 10, I took a lot of positions off the table, kept some positions open overnight, which in hindsight, I shouldn't have because as this came back down and went to 1 to 10 again, let me just switch back to um, forex.com. As this came back down and approached that 1 to 10 again, I indeed closed all of the positions off the table. There was no point of me keeping myself in the trade anymore. And yes, in hindsight, I should have just closed everything last night. I thought to myself, you know, it can potentially come lower and lower and lower throughout Friday. And I still believe it can. I still believe throughout the rest of the day, it can probably go lower and lower. But there's no point of me even analyzing anymore. This was the second 1 to 10 for the week. So I'm quite happy to just close the entire position. And it's okay. I just kept it open overnight, paid some swap charges or swap feeds and it's not the end of the world, you know, we move. So let's go back to FXCM just to summarize this very quickly. This is what I meant when I said paying attention to the range that you're trading. So direction analysis goes hand in hand with take profit analysis is what I'm trying to say. And if you're struggling with that, I did record a video on intraday trade management. Uh, I'll actually link it in the description. Just check the description and it will be there. But direction analysis goes hand in hand with TP analysis and with technical analysis, obviously. So you can always be correct in your direction. But if you don't know where to get out, Every single time, it's as if you have gotten the direction wrong. Imagine getting in over here, riding this to the downside, you're correct in the direction because you didn't get out or because you didn't pay attention to other factors and broke it even early, you wouldn't have been able to profit off of this trade. So this trade, although you were correct on the direction, it would have ended up being a losing trade. I hope that kind of made sense, what I uh, was talking about regarding direction analysis going hand in hand with TP analysis. I hope this breakdown made sense. As I said, just after this, there will be two clips showing um, kind of my live thought processes, I suppose, as I was executing this trade. And by now, hopefully somewhere on the screen, you've seen the MT4 screenshots and all of these things as well. I'll also be linking this screenshot in the description below. So check it out for yourself and go back test it in your time. But I hope this video was valuable. I hope now you have a good understanding of trade and travel, which is what we spoke about at the start of the video, basics of direction analysis, tools that you can use or you should use. And I hope with this breakdown, you get a good idea of why take profit analysis is extremely important for direction analysis. But with that being said, if you got value from the video, make sure to press the like button down below and please subscribe to the channel if you're new. We just hit 50,000 subscribers. I love and appreciate every single one of you. Road to 100K starts now, freedom of information. So with that being said, let's elevate and let's catch some pips. Okay, so I just wanted to quickly record a video on this trade instead of just taking another screenshot. Um, I am currently in this position at 1.22415 mark with a stop loss at 1.22480. This was a screenshot before that was taken a few hours ago. Um, I'm probably going to record a much more detailed breakdown once this trade actually hits that 1 to 10 mark or above and once we start to take positions off the table. Um, but just very quickly and, and you know very briefly, uh, there's a few points that i just like to mention now. Number one, um, I haven't taken any positions off the table yet, so the full uh, risk is still open on this trade. The stop loss has not yet been moved on this trade, so it's still, you know, if it, if it goes above and takes us out, that will be a losing trade. And number three, this was a limit order. It wasn't a market execution. I literally just got back home now. I would have executed this as a market execution. I did have alerts below the entry, um, but as I was leaving the house, I just decided to take this as a limit order, so I'm not missing out. And thankfully, yes, it executed us in at, at exactly 1.22415. So just very quickly, you can see downside liquidity on this trend line over here. You can also see some upside liquidity in this trend line. So your typical, you know, quote unquote pennant formation or triangle formation or whatever, whatever you want to call it was forming here. But generally, the way that we're looking at it is we had downside liquidity on this trend line and upside liquidity. So if there was any unmitigated areas at the top, it you know could have been very good entry opportunities because that would have been a manipulation of that trend line to the upside and mitigation of certain levels. There was this one minute candle at the top of the range, as you can see over there. 
which is what we based our trades on, which is what we based our entries on and the stop loss on. And um, it's exactly kind of what got mitigated over there. You can see that in the process, the trend line was manipulated to the upside. You might even argue with me and say, um, you know, this trend line was manipulated before and then it went up or, you know, maybe it wasn't manipulated. Either way, it doesn't matter. The point is there was downside liquidity. I still consider this move to the upside over here a validation of that trend line. So a lot of people would have seen this move. Initially, a lot of people would have been buying it at this at this third touch of the trend line over here or fourth touch, whatever we want to call it, if we count these as touches. Um, and then getting caught out. And that when they see the push back up, they would have gotten back in their buy positions only for this to come back up, manipulate some of these highs over here, manipulate that trend line, mitigate that one minute candle and start to go down. So again, I'll record a more detailed breakdown as to why this trade was executed and how kind of we saw it and a little bit higher time frame, um, you know, bias and all of these things on it as well once this trade plays out. But I just quickly want to speak about entries around these marks over here. These entries would have been extremely risky entries. So unless you are trading mitigation of a previous level of supply and um, then you're seeing a relevant break of structure and then getting in after, then obviously, you know, if, if that was a thought process and fair enough, that would have been a good entry. But the point is we, we can potentially consider this a mitigation of that supply over there, of that Asian supply. But there was no element of a clear break of structure or a change of character for us to then want to get in at these mitigations. And, um, you know, this does look like a distribution looking behavior, which initially when I was looking at it, I was thinking, should I base some trades on here and put stops above here or even stops above there? Um, but then upon further analysis with that trend line, I realized that any entries based off of that distribution would practically be the same type of entries that the retail community would be taking as well. So it wouldn't necessarily be safe entries. Anyway, I just quickly wanted to, um, you know, record a video instead of just a screenshot to just update this. And this has gone a one to eight. But again, as I said, no positions have been taken off the table yet. The risk is still there. I haven't even broken this trade even. And I am pretty confident that this will give us the one to 10, if not more. Um, but around that one to 10 mark, you know, I'm going to be um, judging whether or not I should keep this trade open, whether I should close the entire thing or just close partials. Um, and to be fair, it makes sense to just get out of the trade completely simply because this would be the second one to 10 for the week, which is phenomenal. And practically the entire position, the entire trade was based on the five to three minute time frame and below. We didn't even necessarily need to look at any higher time frames for um, for this trade. Um, but yeah, good to see it play out. This kind of retracement back up is not really scaring me in any way, shape or form. Uh, it's just coming back up probably to mitigate some more levels. And if it goes and hits stop loss, it hits stop loss. It is what it is. That's, that's you know, part of trading. Um, but I'm pretty confident that this will give us the next leg to the downside. And it's, by the way, I didn't even mention the date and time. It's currently 12th of May, Thursday. It's um, 17.40, so 20 to 6 p.m. UK time. I'm currently in Greece, so it's two hours further ahead for me. It's currently 7.39 or 7.40 p.m. over here. Um, not that that matters in any way, shape or form, but anyway, um, yeah, there you go. I'll come back to this with a bit more detail once this trade plays out and gives us that one to 10. I'm about to leave the house again to go and have some dinner, but again, I'll be managing this on my phone. I will be in fact setting alerts just before it comes and taps off that one to 10. So I'm instantly informed as this kind of gives us another leg to the downside. Um, and yeah, so the, what I'm trying to say is the next video, the next update may be recorded slightly later than when it hits 1 to 10, depending on when it comes down there. Um, anyway, I'll be back with another update very soon. Okay, so I just got back home now. It's currently 22 past 10 p.m. UK time. So we are technically trading into Friday as the final 24 hours of the trading week. Just as a quick update on this trade, we have indeed hit this 1 to 10, um, which is beautiful. As I was out just having dinner, um, it just went ahead and actually um, kind of hit that 1 to 10. My alert went off and thankfully we managed to close a lot of the positions at that 1 to 10. Just bear with me one second. Let me check the exact figures. We got out at 1.21760. 1.21760. Boom. So just over one to ten, well, one to ten, a, a one to ten position that we actually caught to the downside exactly as expected. So brilliant. And by the way, as I was out having dinner, we smashed 50,000 subscribers on the channel. So I just wanted to quickly say thank you very much. 
um, you know, that definitely made my day. And um, yeah, appreciate you all. But I'll keep my thank yous for another video. Uh, I just want to quickly give you an update of this trade. I'm going to slightly more information about it. Again, as I said, I will break down everything properly um, at, a, at a later time where I can go into a bit more detail about the fundamental narrative behind this, about why this trade was executed, why I was on the bearish side for GBP anyway, um, all of these things. But just as a um, kind of quick information regarding this trade, I realized I didn't give too much detail as to why these first entries, these first mitigations at the top, for example, if we even consider these the first mitigations, wouldn't have been the best trades. So um, let, let's let's put it this way. Let's say we are coming off a mitigation of a previous level of supply somewhere over there, which indeed was the case. This was the Asian supply, the Asian distribution that was introduced, um, you know, to the to the to GBP USD to this pair. Um, as you can see, that was the Asian session. So the Asian session opened there came up, distributed the price, and ever since then, it's been dis it's been respecting that distribution to the downside. So as it's coming off the mitigation of that, if we are planning to trade this mitigation, we have to remind ourselves what range we are trading. First things first, we have to get some type of a proof, right, that that mitigation or that supply is still valid. That proof is normally in the form of a breaker structure or invalidation of a relevant level of demand. Some of you may argue and say, Mehdi, this is a rally-based rally in the middle of the range over here. And the fact that the market has broken below it is proof that that has, you know, invalidated a level of demand. And therefore, we can go ahead and trust that supply and take the trade to the downside. I don't disagree with you, but it's about knowing the exact range that you're trading. Because looking at this picture, where I can see the clear, you know, structure points and the clear trend, if I am now to base my trades at the top, just off of the invalidation of this demand, of this rally base rally, I have to know that my target would only be the next level of demand. Where is that? Obviously over here. So nothing wrong with these trades at the top, but it's about knowing where you need to get out. So with these first mitigations at the highest levels, you would end up getting similar entries around 1.2 to 400 mark, let's say, and potentially the best entries you could possibly get around this range, having your stops above, and then you need to start getting out of your trades around these levels of demand, around where this reaccumulation or um, kind of this range of rally base rally took place and this unmitigated candle is there. So that's why the first mitigations was not traded. That's why we waited to see more. And I'm glad we did because it you know, obviously printed a much nicer price action for us to be able to get in with a smaller stop loss. Um, and obviously by then this levels of demand had been invalidated. So we are able to target the lower levels of demand. Um, so invalidated these levels, came down, started to, um, you know, quote unquote, respect this level of um, round off or this level of demand over here. Now we have a battle between the supply and the demand. And the bottom line is one of these has to win. Based on the narrative that we had, we were on the bearish side. So it made sense for us to take the risk on the bearish side, which meant hopefully we would expect the supply to invalidate this low and reach the lower levels of demand. And by then it would have given us the one to 10 to the downside. So um, yeah, beautiful position that we kind of managed to get into, thankfully, and we got out at that 1.21760 mark. Um, and um, you know, I'm, I'm still in this trade in terms of like, I, I, as in I haven't closed 100% of the positions is what I'm trying to say. We've taken partials, but I, I am still in this trade uh, with some minor positions. And um, I'm kind of confident that, you know, throughout tomorrow, we can get another leg to the downside. We've now created downside liquidity over here as well, which is pretty interesting. So I wouldn't be surprised if this comes back up, you know, creates more supply throughout Asia or mitigates some other levels throughout the Asian session and then starts to go down again. Um, so that's why I've kind of kept a position, a part of the positions open at least. And um, other than that, yeah, I hope this kind of update made sense. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail in another longer video about the fundamental narrative behind this and all of these things. Um, but I hope kind of just, just having this picture alongside of this entry and then and by now hopefully somewhere on the screen you've seen the mt4 screenshots and all of that i hope all of that is making sense to you and um and yeah and you hopefully get why this this trade was executed at the top why we waited for those entries at the top over there i believe in the previous clip i did give some information about why um, I wasn't necessarily looking at taking trades based on these levels. Not that it would have been wrong. No, we could have still taken trades based off of this kind of, let's say, distribution in the middle of the range. 
but our stop loss would have had to be the same place. It would have had to still be above there. The reason why these entries at this um, level of slowdown, this level of distribution over here, wasn't the most attractive entries for me was this first kind of mitigations that we started to get at this level of distribution to me looked like the retail trades. To me looked like it was a, just a trend line, um, you know, a rejection of that trend line. So it looked like a lot of retail would be behind this trade. They would be trading even the um, break and retest scenarios of this type of level. So that's why I wasn't too uh, attracted to taking the trades based off of uh, based off of this level of distribution. And that's why I decided to stick to the higher levels and just write it out. Um, so yeah, other than that, I hope this kind of breakdown, uh, I hope this breakdown made sense. And um, it's been phenomenal, really. Two one to ten positions for this week on top of the monstrous GU trade that we are still in. Um, I haven't yet recorded a breakdown for this trade, but I will very soon. I hope this trade made sense. It was a matter of, what, two, three hours <laughs> that we managed to get in and out of that trade, which is brilliant to be able to uh, catch these type of risk rewards um, within a limited number of hours. And it just goes to show what's possible. Um, you know, you can indeed print these on a regular basis, even on a daily basis on a pair if you want to, but it's just not necessary to do it every day and um, not necessary for you to want to be behind the charts that much. It will result in you taking more losses than wins. A lot of people think if, uh, think if they spend more time on the charts, they'll end up taking a lot more trades and a lot of them will be winning trades because they can see more opportunities. That's just not how it works. You know, we have to put the greed, uh, the greed out of our mind and um, really trade what we see. Anyway, I'm going to stop talking now. Once again, thank you for 50k and um, yeah, hope this breakdown made sense.